himself great uh, in the lives of uh, his people. Father God, we love you again and thank you so much for being who you are. We thank you, God, for loving us with your steadfast love. We thank you, God, for the stability uh, that we can get from no one else other than you. We thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit who rules and lives and abides in us and is always looking to direct us in order that we could live out the life that you would have us to live, God. Uh, we thank you, God, for our family, uh, the church family that you've given us. Uh, we pray, God, that you would help us continue to uh, love each other, to pray for one another, to bear one another's burdens, to forgive one another, to care for one another, to uh, support one another, those things that you've commanded us to do in your divine word. So we're here tonight, Lord, again, with another chance to be able to uh, present your word, to be able to hear your word, again, again able to, uh, to sense your presence and your power through your word. And I pray tonight, Lord, as we come for intercessory purposes, we do pray again for our brothers and our sisters who are going through and some are recovering from situations and circumstances of life. God, we thank you for Sister Doris Addison and for where you have brought her. Uh, we know where she was with COVID-19. God, we thank you for the good report today to hear that uh, she is home. Uh, and we thank you so much. Back with Daphne, back with Doug, and uh, God breathing on her own. And so we thank you, God, for your divine protection upon her. We pray for Brother Clyde Berry and Sister Lucy Berry. And we thank you, God, for what you've been doing in their life uh, in terms of Clyde and his cancer that the doctors cannot treat, that the doctors cannot operate on, but we thank you that Clyde is sitting up and getting up and uh, sitting in his real chair at times, but at the same time, uh, seeing again some progress, even though he is in hospice care. Father, we pray the same thing uh, for our own sister Esther Chandler, who is in uh, hospice care, and uh, God just been able to visit with her on yesterday, just to see her encouraged, to see that her mind is still on you, still concerned about her church family, God, demonstrating her love for her church family. We thank you for her. Pray for Brother Jesse Coleman, Lord, who had a major stroke, but now is in the process of rehab and recovery. And so we pray again that you would just touch his body, touch his mind, touch those parts of him that are just going through a tough time. For our own Brother Herman Denson, uh, you know the situations that Herman is facing now and what he is going through. Uh, but God, we know music man knows you and he loves you. And I pray that you would touch his body, touch his mind, touch his spirit. Lord, help him not to become discouraged at any point uh, in this process. Again, for Larry Henry and what Larry is facing and then the surgeries and the life that he's had and even have to have, we just pray you continue to, uh, to keep Larry, Lord, in your perfect peace with his mind always stayed on you, Father. We pray for Sister Mary Wyatt and D. Esther Zachary, for Sister Paul Dunham, Dunham and Sister Almira Ellison, we just ask you continue to bless Sister Maxie RV and Carolyn Ben. You know that situations and circumstances so much better than I ever could. Lord, for Nell and the issues she's dealing with, for Lee Williams and Wanda, uh, for Otto Smith and Brother James Leonard, Luanna, and Reverend Linton Jason. God, you know every one of them, you know every situation, you know every circumstance. And so, Father, we would ask that you would meet the need as only you are able to do. We pray for Lord Wade, Lord who is, uh, has pneumonia and is in the hospital, we ask, Lord, that you would allow recovery of his body, help him to breathe and help him uh, to, uh, to be able to overcome the pneumonia that he is dealing with, that you would touch him, Lord, only as you can touch him. For Brother Richard Patterson, who has uh, suffered again a major stroke, Lord, I pray for him, I pray for Martina, I pray for her courage, I pray for her strength, that she uh, goes through the process of uh, seeing about her husband uh, knowing again, made those vows, Lord, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, never knowing how that's going to transpire. But God, we know that you are great and awesome, God, and you can provide in ways that we cannot understand. Pray for Charlene and the things that she's presently dealing with, that, Lord, as she faces surgery and the like, pray again that you would give her strength for what she has to face. And then, Lord, we lift Kenneth Robeson and his family before you. They are going through a season of bereavement, Lord. You, uh, you chose to allow Vernon to be moved from this world. And so I pray again for them as they go through that grieving process that you would touch their hearts, touch their minds, God. Uh, let them know again that you promised you would never leave them nor would you ever forsake them. I pray that you would fill that void 
uh, that uh, missing of uh, Vernon, he's not going to be with them, but God uh, help them to know that you know how to fill that void, that you will be that brother uh, that you, you need to be, that you will be that friend that you need to be, uh, you will be that relative that you need to be, God. So I pray that you will touch them right where they are as they make preparations on Saturday to bury him and the like. I pray again for your perfect peace, that, that their minds would always stay on you, Father. Then for our church family, God, from Sister Philomena Thomas, uh, to Kobe Bryson, God, we pray for every member of our church. We pray, God, and thank you again for wellness of our church. We thank you, God, for the health of our church. We thank you, God, for the health of finances. We thank you, God, again, for the health of ministries. We thank you, God, most than anything else, for the health of your people, the spiritual health of your people, that we, we, we are concerned, but we're not scared. Uh, we, 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 we lift situations before you, but we will not give up. So thank you for keeping our faith strong, helping us to hold on, to trust in you no matter what. God, we do all of this for your glory and for your honor. We pray that you will be with us tonight as we continue to study your word, as we look at the situations that are going on in our world, and specifically what's going on in America even now. We pray, God, that you will give us a word, a word that help us to look to the hills from whence come at our help, knowing that ultimately all of our help comes from you. So be with us now. Teach us, lead us, guide us, direct us, protect us, rebuke us when it's necessary, chasten us when you have to, so that our lives will reflect your love for us, so that we will live our lives giving you the glory, and we will grow in your grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray these things and we ask it all in his name. Amen. Once again, it's a blessing and a privilege to, uh, to be with you all and to share uh, our lesson on tonight, we are dealing with the issue of um, casting lots and voting, casting lots uh, and voting. I, uh, I clearly know that uh, many of you, some of you uh, voted on yesterday, uh, some of you did a couple of weeks ago within a couple of hours of the early voting starting and the like, and uh, I know that there are sometimes some questions and concerns that we have as it relates to, I hear people say sometimes, does my vote count, you know, does it really matter? Uh, of course, right now, right now in our nation, there's this big uproar about making sure that every vote is counted uh, because we know it's a long process that we are going through. And one of the things I would encourage us to do is uh, for those of us who may have a certain level of frustration about it, uh, you can do things like go to us.gov. If you want to kind of understand the history about what's going on right now, uh, what you will recognize that what we're, what we're experiencing right now is actually more the norm of how everything got started with our voting uh, as far as America is concerned. We have the one gotten used to kind of the fast technology where we're getting information right here and right now. But if you think about the 1800s when all of these things started, it was a much slower process than what we have today. And so what we're experiencing right now is probably more true to our original history than more our recent history uh, in terms of what's going on. So again, if you check that out, us.gov, US it'll give you some insight into what's taking place right now. But for tonight, uh, just ask the Lord just to give me a word that would help us to see what is it in the Bible? Because what we do know is that the Bible clearly teaches us, according to Ecclesiastes, Solomon would say that there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new. So as a result of that, what we do know is that God's word has something to say about anything we experience. There's nothing we do in life that there is not an example that God gives us in his word. That's something that God reveals to us in his word so that we can look at his word and now apply that word to whatever that situation may be in our lives so that we can come out on the end knowing that whatever our responses are, whatever our choices are, whatever our decisions are, we're doing it, watch this, in line with the word of God or else we're doing it in disobedience to the word of God. So, uh, you know, when again prayed about it, asked us, Lord, what, what is it about our voting that comes closer or is a reflection of what you gave us in the Bible, in your word, throughout you, the history of your time that you chose to reveal yourself to humanity? What, what is that for us? And, it, and the issue again is really lots. Uh, we look at scripture, it's, it's about lots. And, the, you know, the issue of lots, we don't, we don't know what that 
particular instrument itself was based on scripture, but it could have been sticks, it could have been various uh, lints, it could have been flat stones, it could have been pebbles, um, it could have been things like coins, but whatever it was, it was used by the people of antiquity, uh, we read it in the Bible, it was used by them to make choices, it was used by them to make decisions, sometimes that they were uncertain about, but with the hope that some way, somehow, what they did would reflect, again, their attachment to the fact that they were trusting God for the answer, if I could say it that way. They were trusting God for the answer. Remember at that time, they, they are absent of the Holy Spirit like we are. They are absent of um, uh, necessarily the, the, the scripture when you look at, you know, look at Abraham and, and uh, even in the time of Moses, we know the scripture then was just being written, if you would, uh, that we would understand that. So the handout that, I, that, I, that many of you have, and I do want to apologize for this morning. We were having some server trouble, uh, but I thank God our friend, our brother, uh, uh, Robert Bell, was able to give us some insight, some technical support, if you will, uh, to help us to uh, overcome some of the issues that, that we overcame earlier this morning. So uh, as Christians who read the Bible and live in America, we're actually exposed to three forms, if you can read along with me if you choose, of government. The Bible identifies theocracy, which is a government ruled by God. And where do we see that? The nation of Israel was under this form of government. And we see in the Bible, we go from Exodus to Ruth, that is the form of government that the nation of Israel was under. So when we come from, to, from 1 Samuel, throughout the New Testament, we have what is called the monarchy. And what is a monarchy? Which is a government ruled by a king. Then in our case, we have what is called, as we call it, a democracy, and it is a government for the people, of the people, by the people. However, we gotta bear in mind that God has, has not and never will revoke his right to rule as is written in Daniel chapter four. Uh, you look at verse three, verse 17, verse 25, verse 32, verse 35 of the book of Daniel. This is what God says, and he says it through a pagan king, uh, a, if you would, a king who was all about himself, loved to talk about himself, loved to brag about himself by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And he came to realize, and it's actually written by the Holy Spirit, Daniel wrote it, inspired by God. These were the words that came from Nebuchadnezzar that he says, the most high rules in the kingdom of men and he gives it to whomever he wills, whomever he chooses. As a matter of fact, one of the verses would actually say, he gives it to even to the lowest of men. So even though God has allowed, and we, see, we do know that in scripture, um, even though God has allowed hum humanity to rule, humanity's rule does not override God's rule. So, so, how, so how do we reconcile our structure of government a democracy that promotes human freedom with the sovereign will of God. For those of us uh, who have truly trusted in the sacrificial death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, we do so on the truth of the scriptures. Remember, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, I delivered to you that which was also delivered to me, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, what? According to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures, and then it said, and then he was seen. So we believe, as believers, we understand faith alone and Christ alone for our salvation. And so as a result, everything we believe about God, just like we do our salvation, is based on what God has revealed to us in his scriptures. And we can count on 2 Timothy chapter 3, you know, he says all scripture what is given by the inspiration of God and is good for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God what might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So it doesn't matter what the situation may be in our own lives, God has a word for us. So the scripture tells us, first of all, all government is appointed by God. All government is appointed by God. Uh, Romans 13, 1. He says that all government is appointed by God, and there's a purpose for it. Again, he says, uh, he reminds us in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says, so that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all reverence. So God 
expects us to do what? To obey the ordinances of man, he would remind us in 1 Peter chapter 2, and we do it what? For the Lord's sake. So human government has absolutely been ordained and appointed, if you will, by God. So now, so how does a democracy that entails the freedom to vote fit with God's right to rule? That's a good question, and I'm glad y'all asking it. Uh, the, Bible, the Bible gives examples of people casting lots in the process of making uncertain decisions. It was a means of selection that entailed various forms. Again, and, you may, and, and some of the passages that we're going to look at, those passages are, are seen actually in, uh, in the Old Testament. And so what we keep in mind, here's what the scripture reminds us, uh, that for whatever things were written in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, for whatever things were written, were written before for our learning that through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. So the Old Testament, the New Testament is utilized by believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament becomes an example for us. The fulfillment of it, we see it for the most part in the person of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. But we can utilize the Old Testament as, a, as an example for things that Again, that apply to our daily lives and see how in the context of the Old Testament we can apply those things to our lives to see examples for us in our particular circles of contact. So here's what I want you to do. Turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. And we're going to now look at, unpack the issue of casting lots. First, one of the first mentions of it that we see in the Bible, it had to do with the sacrifice. In other words, that God had said to Israel, every year they were to offer a, an animal, if you would. It was called what, the Day of Atonement, whereby the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would offer to God a sacrifice for the sins of a nation. And then he would also offer sacrifice for himself. And the other thing that he did is that they would choose a scapegoat. And that scapegoat had the purpose, again, of representing taking away the sins of the people. So when you look at Leviticus chapter 16, verse 8 through 10, the word of God says, Then Aaron cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. Now again, notice what scripture says. They cast lots for it, but, but the agenda for them to do that was set by someone. Go back to verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of his two sons of Aaron, and when they offered profane fire before the Lord, and the Lord, notice again, and the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come uh, just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is in on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the cloud before the mercy seat. So who said the agenda? It was the Lord. Did they cast lots? Absolutely. One lot fed, fell on the lamb that was sacrificed. The other lot fell on the scapegoat. But the idea and the agenda for it was set by who? The Lord. They did have a vote. They had to pick one or the other, but the agenda was already set by the Lord. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter, uh, chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10 is actually the, uh, the first time that Israel has a king. And they're in the process again of, uh, of establishing that king up until, so when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 10, that's where we see what we call the establishment of the monarchy. In, in what we look at in, uh, in, in Leviticus, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, when we look at all of those passages, that is the theocracy. That is a government ruled by God. Now we're coming into a monarchy. It is a government that is now ruled by a king. But notice something. Notice something that's very, very important. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 19 and 21, this is uh, Samuel speaking. He has, he's, he's bit upset with the people notice what he says but but you have today rejected your God who himself saved you from your adversaries and your tribulations 
And you have said to him, no, set a king over us. Now therefore present yourself before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, watch the word, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. And when he caused the tribe of Benjamin to come nearby their families, the family of Matri was chosen. Then the son of Kish, Saul the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, they could, they could not be found. All right? So here they're going through this process uh, again of bringing all the tribes before them. But God is using a process of elimination. He uses a process of elimination. He starts with the first tribe, and he goes basically all the way to the last son of Jacob, and he picks that tribe from the very last son of Jacob, who is Benjamin. But watch this. Who set the agenda? Look at verse, look at verse uh, 18, the, the, the previous verse. Just wanted to do it that way. I'm going to read 18, 17 and 18. Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah. And said to the children of Israel, watch this, thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought Israel out of Egypt, delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians, and from the hand of all kingdoms, and from those who oppressed you. So who set the agenda? The Lord did set the agenda. As a matter of fact, when the Bible says that, when he says you're gonna, you want to set a king before you, he is literally taking this thing all the way back to 1,440 years before Christ was born, that when they're getting ready to go into the promised land, when you read Deuteronomy 17, he says, when you get in the promised land and when you say, give us a king like all the other nations. Boy, that's some cold-blooded people. That is some cold-blooded people. God has been their ruler. God has been their king. God has been their provider. God has been the one who has delivered them from their enemies. He's done all of that for them. But when they're getting ready to now go into the promised land, they, he knows they're going to say, once they're in the promised land, they're going to say, give us a king like all the other nations. Yeah. Oh, oh, my goodness. Yeah. But he already knew that, so who set the agenda? Although they chose, it, it appears, it appears that they went through the process of Reuben and Simeon and Issachar and Judah and Gad and Asher, they went through all of that. They went through Ephraim, Manasseh, they, 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 they went through all of that process, but it's God ultimately who set the agenda. Let's go to Jonah chapter 1. We're almost done in the Old Testament. Go to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. I know somebody saying, why we got to go through all these scriptures? It's Bible study. So it's all right. Jonah chapter number 1. And most of us know that story. It's one it's one of the great narratives of scripture. Um, you know, most of our babies know, you know, Jonah in the whale, in the whale. Oh, I'm sorry, Jonah in the belly of the fish. <laughs> yeah, so, so when we go to Jonah chapter 1, look at verse 7 in particular. The verse says, And they said to one another, Come, let us, here's that word, cast lots. Remember we read in, 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 uh, in uh, 1 Samuel 10, chosen, but he says, let us come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and watch this, and the lot fell on who? On Jonah. All right, so here we go. Here it is. God, so who set the agenda, though? Who set the agenda? Go back to chapter 1, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah. <laughs> so it's telling us that even though the people are on the ship, and one of the things you got to understand about these persons, these were Gentiles, these were pagans, these were idol worshipers. They were calling on every God that they could possibly call on. So, but the Bible says that when they cast lots, whether it was a stone, whether it was sticks, uh, you know, wh whether it was some kind of pebble that they cast, whatever it was, however it turned out, the lot fell on Jonah. But, but, but who caused the storm? Well, we do know, verse 4, but the Lord set out a great wind in the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken. So it gives us evidence. They cast lots. They voted for who would be the one causing the trouble, but the lot fell on Jonah. Why? Because God had already set the agenda. He set the agenda. He allowed them to participate 
but he is the one who set the agenda. Now we're going to the New Testament. Come on, let's keep, let's keep rolling on. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27. In Matthew 27, we're actually dealing with our Lord himself. But our Lord himself, he is on the cross at this point. Jesus Christ is on the cross at, in Matthew chapter uh, 27. He is on the cross of Calvary. And the Bible says, then they crucified him, verse 35, Matthew 27. They crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. And of course, we have a quote there. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Well, we ask ourselves the question, where did that come from? Well, you would have to go back to uh, Psalm uh, 22, verse 18. So now, when you think about the fact that David is responsible for writing that, just do this for me. Let's go back to Psalm, let's go to Psalm 22 also. Let's go to Psalm 22. I think this is amazing. I think it's important uh, that you see how, again, they cast lots. Um, and because what they, what they were looking at, here's Jesus' robe is all woven together. So they didn't want to tear it. And so they decided to cast lots. So what one person, if you would, could get that robe and whatever it is that the Roman soldiers did with it, that's what they were. But they cast lots for it. Uh, because, again, of just how it was woven, how it was made. It says in verse 18, they divide my garments. Now, this is, this, is, this is David speaking in the immediate context in 22, 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing, he says, they cast lots. Well, when he is talking about that, he is, in a sense, lamenting about what is happening to him, what has happened to him, in his own immediate history, the experience that David had, and he writes a song concerning it, but it still goes back to the fact, God said the agenda. Look at Rome, look at again, Psalm 22, look at verse 1. Who set that agenda? Notice what he says, my God, my God, <laughs> why have you forsaken me? And from, and, uh, uh, why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, I am not silent. So here it is. We have a psalm where David is crying out to the Lord, but through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Matthew actually records what happened to Jesus on the cross in something that had already taken place, Warren, 900 years before Jesus was born. <laughs> so it's God setting the agenda where these total strangers, these total Roman, Roman soldiers who are Gentiles, don't care nothing about the things of God. All these guys are, are professional persecutors. They are professional killers. They, they are abusing Jesus. They've been given the charge to kill Jesus, but they are actually being used by God at that point to fulfill scripture. They cast lots, but who said the agenda? God did. Here's another example. Go to Luke now, chapter 1. Kind of working, walking through it. This is fun. This is so much fun. Woo! Luke chapter 1. We get another example. Uh, we saw the sacrifice. We saw the king. We saw the prophet. We saw the Christ. Now we're getting ready to look at a priest. And this priest again would be, we would find him in the Gospels. Remember the Gospels are the transition between what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Gospels basically give us the history or the narrative of the life of Jesus Christ. So now, what is happening here? We look at, at, at uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. Here it is. So it was that while he was serving, his name is Zacharias, if you would, <clears throat> as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, watch this, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. It appears when you just read this, he is doing what he's supposed to do um, according to scripture that David had, 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 had come up with this, this, this grand idea that certain priests would serve at certain times of the year, certain times of the month they had the responsibility to serve. Now, God is getting ready to bring in Jesus Christ. But before he brings in Jesus Christ, 
He got to go back to Malachi chapter 4, and he's got to now bring in the forerunner of Jesus Christ, who's John the Baptist. So here is this man, a priest. He's just doing what he's supposed to be doing in the temple. And it just appears to happen that while he's doing that, the angel Gabriel shows up, and he gives him a message that your wife, who's been barren, her name is Elizabeth, hadn't had a child in no matter how many years, is now going to conceive and she's going to bring forth the child, and that child is going to be the one who announces the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what it's saying is that it was it, it, he, 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 the lot was on him to be serving at that time, but remember, it was orchestrated by God. He had already talked about it in Malachi chapter 4, 400 years before Jesus came that he's saying there's going to be a child, there's going to be a man, there's going to be one who's going to come because now what it is showing that even though the lot was there for Zacharias, looking like a normal thing that he does, God set the agenda that at the time God appointed, Zacharias was where he needed to be for God to do what he wanted to do through him. Wow. Here's one final one. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 23. Acts chapter 1, look at verse number 23. This is, this is pretty cool. This is, as a matter of fact, this is really the only place you actually find it in the, old, in the New Testament um, uh, in terms of what transpired. So again, let's look at verse 23. Acts chapter 1. And they proposed two. Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justus, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen. They need to vote to take part in the ministry and apostleship from which Judas, by transgression, failed that he might go to his own place. Notice what they did, verse 26. They weren't certain. Both of these men were qualified, and they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, of course, again, it's not hard to see who set that agenda because notice what happens in verse 24. It says, then they prayed and said, you, O Lord. So who's setting the agenda? Who are they relying on to be able to get the right answer, to choose as they would would see the right person because they're looking at two people who are both equally qualified. They're not sure which one of them they're supposed to choose. So they do what? They go through the process of casting lots but it's with the hope, the understanding, the expectation, if you will, that God is going to give them the answer through them doing that ritual or that custom of casting lots. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. But God has already set the agenda because the reality is, is that, you know, though, though they did that and it, and it made sense at that time, But ultimately, God had somebody else in mind, and that's the one we call Paul, who was called Saul of Tarsus. That ultimately, he becomes that apostle that goes to preach to the Gentiles because we don't don't hear anything else about Matthias as an apostle after after this situation. But what's happening here? What's going on here? Back to the handout. As noted, in each of these scriptures, the Lord God was involved in every incident where casting lots took place. Therefore, we can count on God to demonstrate his right to rule even our, I mean, I just use that terminology, so-called democracy. Yeah, a government of the people, for the people, or by the people. Solomon, Solomon summed it up this way in Proverbs 16, 33. You can turn to that passage, but it's actually in your handouts. For those of you that may not have, you want to turn to the passage, and I'm going to read it. Uh, just in terms of how it is in the New King James. He says, the lot is cast into the lap. But listen to this language. Mike and Mike, Zach, listen to this. But it's every decision is what? From the Lord. You can say, he, again, he's saying, you can, you, can, you can cast your vote. You ought to cast your vote. You ought to have you, your pebble. You ought to have your stone. However it is, you cast your vote. But at the end of the day, understand that the decision belongs to the Lord. Wow. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. So so here's the other thing. 
Jesus taught us to pray it in the model prayer. If we, if we pray at any point, and I'm not condoning that you ought to pray the model prayer every time you pray. I'm not saying that you, sh you should, should pray the model prayer or, or don't have to pray the model prayer every time you pray. But one of the things that you do pray, if you ever pray it, Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 10, your kingdom come, your what? Will be done, where? On earth, as it is in heaven, right? All right, so here's the question. What you don't want have God to have his will over your life? What area of your life that you don't want God to have his will to be done? So think about it. Even when it comes to voting, <laughs> God ought to have his will being done. Even though, watch this, I may not be certain who this person is. It may not be the person that I selected. It may not be the person that I chose. It may not be the one that I used that machine and turned my little finger and, and cast my ballot for that one. But here's a, what I do as a child of God. I trust that God's will is being done. I rely on that. I depend on that. I do my part from a standpoint as a human being. So, so, what, so what, just finally, last sentence on the, on the, on the, the handout we gave. So as, as we have exercised our right to vote, and I put in parenthetically, not commanded in the scripture, and let me tell you why I say that. Got, got, got to think about this. Got to keep stuff in perspective. Got to keep stuff in perspective. Our form of government is unusual. It's unique. It's, it's different than probably any other nation on the face of the planet. Correct? But, but you got to keep in mind, as a country, we have only existed for 244 years. The question is now, what was God doing prior to our 244 years? He was running it. That's the bottom line. He was letting his will be done. Nothing has changed about that. So even though we have existed for, for 244 years, and we have, yes, at utilize our human right to vote and we cast our vote. Why? Because it's a government of the people, for the people, by the people. We can choose the persons that we want. But at the end of the day, what we've got to understand, God has not relinquished his right to rule. It's not like he ordained the government of the United States of America and then God said to America, look, y'all go and do this the way y'all want. I'm going to just stand over to the side. You know, however y'all want to run this thing. It's all, it, no, 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 no. He has not done that. Listen, um, at the age of 18 years old, you know, got, 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 uh, uh, I was able to have this 1976 Buick Regal. Ooh! Boy, I can't remember. It was a nice, clean car, man. I mean, and back then, you know, you could get, you could get the big white sidewalls and all that. Mike, I had it clean. It had the big white sidewalls. I had the wheels on it, man. And boy, I'm talking about, you know, you know, lean in the sheen. Oh, boy, I used to love, I used to love that car. You know, but I understood something. I understood something. Whenever I left, whenever I left 7402 Cattle, it was very clear to me I had certain freedoms. I didn't really have to tell at this point, I don't have to tell my daddy where I'm going, you know, hey, dad, I'm going, you know, but I don't, I have to, I could, I could go, because I worked on the southwest side of town, I knew places on the southwest side of town, so I could drive all the way to the southwest side of town anytime I was ready. Anytime I was ready. However, it was understood I had to be back on the northeast side of town at a certain time. You get me? <laughs> because even though I got the freedom to choose and, and do what I want, I lived in a house where I recognized I got some limitations. And what God is still saying to us. Yes, you vote. You cash your vote. You ought to vote. You got a right to vote. You ought to exercise that vote because it's what you've been given in your freedom as a citizen of the United States of America. But when you cast that vote, you've also got to remember, I'm still God. 
I'm still in charge. I'm still going to put in office who I want to put in office, Daniel chapter 4. I'm going to raise them up. I'm going to put them down. I'm still doing that. I'm giving you that right to participate in what I'm doing. But at the end of the day, whoever I put in, because they are over the government, guess what? You still got to do what I said, obey every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. You know, y'all know how that go. I mean, we get, once we get another president, sometimes the rules change, you know, things for the IRS and all that kind of thing. You know when you file your taxes that year, you can't do what you did the previous year. You got to do what that government said. This is, this, this is true, and I'm, I'm about done. I'm about done. We just, we just, we just change over to uh, 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 the standard time last Sunday, right? Last Sunday, right? Okay. We, said, we changed it. So, and we had been on what? Daylight, daylight saving time. My grandmother. Uh, Melonia, she uh, she never changed her clock. She never changed her clock when we would go to daylight saving time. She said, "I ain't changing my clock, Shay, because I'm on God time." But here was the deal. Here was the deal. She wouldn't change her clock, but she knew what time the television program she liked. <laughs> she knew what time they would come on, so she would adjust her schedule in her mind, <laughs> even though she didn't change her clock on the outside. Y'all get what I'm saying? See, she said, in her mind, I'm on God time. But she had to make that adjustment. And all God is saying to us, you're going to make certain choices, You got, but you got to live with the choices, ultimately, that I have made, because we have to understand, at the end of the day, God is our Father, and he still wants his will to be done. That's, that's, and we count on that, folks. We, we rely on that. Why? Because he is such a good father. He is a merciful father. He is a gracious father. He is such a kind father. And he can see things that we can't see. He knows things we don't know. He's going to figure out everything that he is to figure out. So we count on that. We rely on that. Here's one final thing. Go on, go on, uh, go on uh, uh, Psalm 115. And just for our edification, I want to read that whole chapter. The whole chapter. I love, I love Psalm 115. He says, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory. Because of your mercy, because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God, whoo, I love that, yeah. is in heaven, and he does Whatever he pleases. He does it according to Ephesians chapter 1 says, he does everything what? For his own good pleasure. Yeah. Their idols are silver and gold, their work of their work of men's hand. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they don't see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have but they do not walk, nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Oh, house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, that's us, y'all. Trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great, young and old, skinny and tall, however it is. He blesses us, whether we're young or whether we, he is the one who blesses us. Verse 14, may the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. They do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Woo! <laughs> praise the Lord. And so, folks, here's the deal. We don't, we don't do the thing with casting lots anymore. After we look at, at Acts chapter 1, we don't see that happening in the New Testament. But what do we have? We have the Holy Spirit who lives in us. 
that we're able now to make choices that are pleasing to God on the basis of what? What God has said to us in his word. If you would read John uh, chapter 16, he would remind us that he's going to start at verse 13. It says that he will guide us, what? Into all truth. Because when he comes, the Holy Spirit comes, he's not testifying of himself, but he's testifying what? of the things of God. So whether or not your candidate won, will win, didn't win, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, Ultimately, our aim has always been and will always be to trust the Lord, to trust in the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to rely on his presence, to rely on his power, to make our decisions not on the basis of our feelings, but to make those decisions on the basis of our faith and trust God with the final results. But at the end of the day, no matter what happens, however it turns out, we always want to give him the glory. Because to complain about what didn't happen that I thought should have happened says in a very real sense that you're not pleased with the way he did it. So please, by all means, um, understand. Uh, You can cast lots or you can vote. But ultimately, the proverb would say to us, every decision is from the Lord. Father God, we thank you so much again for your word. We pray that your word is falling on good ground in the hearts and minds of us, your people. Uh, to the end, Lord, that as we look at what's going on in America, a lot of turmoil, a lot of chaos. But Lord, we know that those of us who are believers are experiencing just your overwhelming peace. Because you say, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. You said, let our request be made known to you. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Uh, we'll be revisiting one another. Don't forget that there is going to be a fundraiser here at the church Saturday starting at 10 o'clock until 2 o'clock. And it's basically for uh, to help. It's a starter uh, 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 organization that actually comes out of Beaumont. Uh, many of us know former Terry Roseman, who's Terry Lucy now. Uh, she's going to earn a husband or, or leading that organization. And what we want to do is support an organization in Beaumont, Houston, and also maybe San Antonio and eventually Dallas that helped our uh, homeless veterans. And we know that that is a population that is often forgotten. So if you can just come by possibly just to share a donation with them, whatever it may be.